But first, we begin tonight with a frightening question. What if the next presidential election is already decided? What if the MAGA Republican-led House of Representatives decided to just steal the election on their own? We talk about democracy under threat a lot on this show because it is very much under threat. But we need to talk about, like, how real that threat is with someone like Speaker Mike Johnson at the helm. It's all outlined in a new op-ed by Tom Rogers, editor-at-large for Newsweek, who makes the case that the ability to manipulate an election outcome is far greater now than ever before. Rogers writes that the potential overturning of the upcoming 2024 election is even more plausible and dangerous than it was in 2020, because the Republican Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, is not only an election denier, but also a ringleader of the previous effort. Rogers quotes from a recent article published in the Washington Spectator, written by political veterans Mark Medish and Joel McCleary. The piece states that next to the election of the president, nothing is more important than the election of the new speaker, writing, quote, the party controlling the speakership has the potential power to reverse the results of the presidential election and deliver the White House to itself. The piece outlines exactly how and why this should terrify Americans in this dangerous scenario. The current election denying Republican majority in the days following the November elections might decide that they are going to challenge the results of certain House races that Democrats won just because because they don't like the results. They don't like how the American people voted. Democracy be damned. And then. Per this scenario, the current Republican majority could deny certification of enough Democratic election winners to preserve the Republican majority in the Congress. Once the Republicans have effectively stolen the House majority and elected a speaker, the next step in an election denial process would be to refuse to certify the Electoral College results of certain states, which would mean neither candidate gets to the 270 Electoral College votes needed to win. That would throw the election to the House of Representatives. And once the presidential race is thrown to the House, the president is chosen on a state-by-state -state delegation vote, a vote that in the current House makeup, Republicans would win. And Trump would be the president, regardless of whether a majority of Americans or even a majority of the Electoral College chose him. Now, of course, a major factor in this scenario is having a full cadre of election deniers who continue to claim that Joe Biden is not the legitimate president and that the 2020 election results should never have been certified, which, of course, Trump and his congressional flunkies continue to claim. Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, for instance, once normie Republican and now full-fledged MAGA, which also explains how she's the fourth-ranking House Republican, would not even commit to certifying the 2024 election results during an interview with NBC's Christian Welker. What about 2024? Congress we will Senate? see if this is a legal and valid election. But just to be very clear, I don't hear you committed to certifying the election results. Will you only commit to certify the results if, if former President Trump wins? If they, Does that mean if the former President Trump no, wins? No, it means if they are constitutional. What we saw in 2020 was unconstitutional circumventing of the, of the Constitution. Medish and McCleary write in their piece that good faith can no longer be assumed. That is certainly the case. Before Mike Johnson became speaker, meaning before anyone knew who he was, the Louisiana congressman was a mouthpiece for wild conspiracy theories supporting the big lie. He then voted against certifying Biden's victory, even after the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Mike Johnson isn't just an election-denying Republican speaker who could overturn a presidential election, as if that wasn't enough. He's a man with a two-seat majority who cannot pass a budget, but manages to secure enough Republican votes to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, simply because that is what Trump wants. He also has some intense Christian nationalist leanings. I am a Bible-believing Christian. Someone asked me today in the media, they said, it's a curious, people are curious, what does Mike Johnson think about any issue under the sun? I said, well, go pick up a Bible off your shelf and read it. That's, that's my worldview. That's what I believe. Okay, so his worldview, his views stem from his, his take on the Bible. Not a big deal if you're a civilian or a regular voter. But quite the problem when you're House Speaker and relying on your particular interpretation of a religious book to determine public policy rather than, you know, I don't know, the Constitution. But also, Speaker Mike, 
What was that part in the Bible about treating the foreigner as one of your own? Per Politico, Johnson delivered a presentation last weekend at a Republican retreat in Florida, which came off more like a sermon, according to two people in the room. Johnson contended that when one doesn't have God in their life, the government or the state will become their guide, referring back to Bible verses. One of the sources there wasn't having it. I'm not at church, they said. Meaning Johnson is so far out there that even other Republicans are pushing back on the God talk. But this is why we need to be very concerned. Mike Johnson has the conviction, the motivation, and now the opportunity to steal the next election for Donald Trump. He is a far right wing evangelical Christian who suggested his election as House Speaker was ordained literally by God, even billing himself as a modern day Moses. So if God tells him to steal a few elections to make Trump president, what's he going to do? And then what happens if God tells him to make Trump president for life? Joining me now is Democratic Congressman Eric Swalwell of California and Michael Waldman, president and CEO of the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU, law, at NYU School of Law and the author of The Supermajority, How the Supreme Court Divided America. Now, normally I would defer to the congressman first, but I'm going to apologize to Congressman Swalwell and come here to the table to Michael Waldman, because you wrote about this before. You have, you have talked through this scenario. Um, I think when, when folks saw that article in Newsweek, they thought that would never happen. Could that happen? Well, we have learned that we need to be imaginative about what could be done because things we never thought were possible happened in yeah. 2020 and before. Uh, and so we need to look at all these ways that, you know, in our country, unlike other democracies, there's no umpire who says, oh, yeah, this person won, that person won, neutral and respected. Right. It turns out to be this very slapdash system going back many years mm -hmm. where you can manipulate things. Now, there's good news. Even Mike Johnson, even this election denier who no one ever heard of, who's now the speaker, is constrained by this law that was passed uh, in the, at the end of the last Congress, the Electoral Account Reform Act. Mm -hmm. It is harder for him to try to throw the election in that way than it would have been a few years ago. That's the good news. The bad news is, is we have to be really vigilant. For example, the attacks on these things have actually moved to the states. Right. You now have election deniers who've sort of wormed their way into jobs running elections in local areas. Uh, now, there's courts and there's laws and constitutions in the states that st have stopped that kind of stuff mm -hmm. up until now. But we need to be on our game. Anybody who cares about democracy between now and uh, when the next president puts their hand on that Bible. Yeah, I mean, Congressman Swalwell, here's the challenge. <laughs> Pretty much everyone who is setting themselves up in their hope of being the next hang Mike Pence, which I don't know why anybody would want that job since Donald Trump did try to get the last guy killed. But they all want to be president. They all want to be vice president with him, right? Here's Byron Donalds talking about whether he would, re would support rejecting the 2024 result if Trump doesn't win. I think Congress has a, has a responsibility within the electoral process to be that last constitutional check on what happened in states. If there are issues where states were av avoiding election procedures that were passed by the legislature, ignoring them out of hand, or if there was some clear subversion that was going on, members of Congress have a responsibility to speak to that. So he's not the only one who talks that way, Congressman Elise Stefanik. There's a reason Kirsten Welker asked her, are you saying you would refuse to certify the election unless Trump wins? She wouldn't answer. Ron DeSantis has said, well, Mike Pence did his duties. So we're not sure about him. Tim Scott would not answer the question. He wants to be vice president. Uh, Rivek Ramaswamy said, yeah, he would have certified, but Pence should have done some magical reforms. The others haven't really addressed it. But there are enough of them that are serving with you who have said, mm, uh, Joy, Republicans uh, don't any longer believe in uh, the ideas of freedom and democracy. Those are the ideas that America was founded upon. They don't believe in an idea anymore of America. They believe in an idol, and that idol is Donald Trump. And when you talk about Speaker Johnson's faith, his faith doesn't concern me. Uh, you know, every American has a you know choice to you know follow a god. Uh, or, or to not. Uh, but what should concern anyone of faith is that the first commandment uh, in the Christian faith uh, is to not follow any other gods, you know, to just mm -hmm. follow the Lord. And they have put everything uh, into helping Donald Trump. They've taken uh, our uh, house and turned it into a law firm. And, and the professor would probably appreciate that uh, the house is now the largest law firm in D.C. 
and they work every day for just one client. And, and it doesn't matter if that defies uh, freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. They have put that idol uh, above uh, the idea of democracy. Yeah, that is the First Commandment. Thou shalt have no other God before me. Um, idolatry is actually a sin. Uh Republicans right now are struggling to get their positions straight on IVF after the Alabama Supreme Court ruled that frozen embryos should be considered children and those who destroy them can be held liable for wrongful death. This ruling is just the latest post row reality that has caused mass outrage and fear across the country. And Republicans are starting to realize that, you know, maybe forcing women to live in a Christian nationalist handmaid's tale hellscape isn't particularly good for their politics. Alabama Senator Tommy Tuberville, who, let's just be honest, is maybe not the brightest senator, when asked about this yesterday, went from the ruling is good to wait, no, it's bad, to actually, I don't know how I feel, over the course of just three minutes. Do you have a reaction to the Alabama Supreme Court ruling on the fact that embryos are children? Yeah, I was all for it. We need to have more kids. We need to have an opportunity to do that. And this, I thought this was the right thing to do. But IVF is used to have more children. And right now, IVF services are paused at some of the clinics in Alabama. Aren't you concerned that this could impact people who are trying to have kids? Well, that's for, that's for another conversation. Senator, what do you say to the women right now in Alabama who no longer have access to IVF or who will not as a result of this ruling? What do you say to them? Well... Well, that's a hard one. It really is. It's really hard. Because, uh, again, you want people to have that opportunity. And, and that's what I was telling her. We need more kids. And, you know, I'd have to look at the entire bill of how it's written. I have not seen it. Mm. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. This is the consequence of Republicans' own actions. Republicans championed getting rid of Roe for years. They wanted this reality. They just didn't want the political consequences that come with it. So don't let them fool you when they try to back away from it, because there are far right lawmakers at the state and federal level who want this kind of policy everywhere, not just in Alabama. Joining me now is Amanda Zaroski, lead plaintiff in the Texas abortion ban lawsuit, and Michelle Goldberg, New York Times columnist and MSNBC political analyst. Um, I'm going to turn to my journalist friend here, Michelle, and ask if you understand who the we is and who is the entity that needs more kids. Who's the we and why do they need more kids? Well, I think that there is a great deal of concern on the right about falling birth rates among some very specific populations, mm. right? I mean, and this is true globally. And it's interesting to kind of hear him say that in the context of talking about the end of Roe versus Wade. Right. Because but which populations? Because you, you're saying he, who's the we? Right. He, I well, I mean, I think, I, I think that this is obviously, he's talking about white people, although I have a feeling if you confronted him front on it and he wasn't stumbling too much, he <laughs> would say something like America. Uh, okay. But yeah, but they also need more kids. But then when immigrant kids come, we don't have space and we don't need more kids when it's immigrant. We're going to figure that out. Um, let me go to you, Amanda, because you, you are in this situation of, of, of IVF using IVF really as a result of what was done to you physically by the inability to get an abortion, to have normal health care. And so this placed you in a position of needing to use IVF. What do you do now with the prospect that maybe Texas could follow Alabama and make it very difficult for you to use IVF? Well, you're exactly right. And the irony is not lost on me that the same people who support the bill um, and the laws and the bans that put my life at risk because I couldn't get an abortion when I needed one to save my life, are now in the same camp of the folks who are saying that I shouldn't have the choice to use IVF and I shouldn't have the ability to um, make decisions over how and when I create a family. And um, the fear that a similar law or ruling or bill will, will come into effect in Texas is, is such, and it's so terrifying that my husband and I signed the paperwork today to get our embryos out of the state because I am so terrified of what will happen if if we're under the same situation that those poor folks in Alabama are in. And, and so, I mean, because the idea for you in using IVF, do you consider those embryos to already be living children? No, I hope that one day they will become children, but... With laws like this and rulings like this that are being passed, 
we might never even know because they're going to take away the opportunity for right. me to potentially implant them. Yeah. And, you know, Michelle, there, let, let me just give you a few examples here. These are these are recently backed bills that make the same argument as Alabama's 125 House Republicans, including mm -hmm. Speaker Mike Johnson. They've co-sponsored sponsored something called the Life at Conception Act, which states that the term human being includes all stages of life, including the moment of fertilization, cloning or other moment at which an individual member of the human species comes into being. It does not include an exception for IVF. The chair of the NRSC, Stephen, Senator Stephen Daines of Montana, co sponsored a bill in 2021 that claimed that homo sapiens born and unborn are entitled to the full protections of the 14th amendment um they, they all they're for it they want right. to make it illegal everywhere well i don't know if they actually do i don't know if they actually want to make ivf illegal so much as they don't want to deal with the kind of actual consequences of their ideology and its contradictions right. because you see them now rushing to distance themselves from something that was totally predictable and that pe feminists and people who care about reproductive health have been screaming screaming about for years, that right. this is once you, that kind of personhood impacts reproductive, you know, it impacts abortion, it also impacts fertility treatment, and it impacts contraception. Right. And, you know, kind of everything people warned about, about a post-Roe America, mm -hmm. that was considered hysterical beforehand, we're seeing it all come to pass. Yeah. And so you, what you see them doing now in um, Alabama, they're talking about changing the definition of personhood, not to conception, but begins at implantation, right? But I think it just shows you how cynical it is. And nobody, there are vanishingly few people who actually believe that an embryo or a blastocyst you is a human. It. Let's just be clear. You can't take a baby and freeze it. The baby would die. <laughs> well, not just the that. The fact you can freeze I it think, means it's right. not alive. I think all these people, you know, if they're in a burning building with one, and they can either save one baby or 10,000 embryos, right? Correct. We kind of, nobody really believes that these two are equivalent well, things. I'm not sure because there are Republicans who've talked about abortion and think that pregnancy happens in the stomach where a baby would be <laughs> digested. I mean, and they've legitimately said in the stomach, they don't seem to understand. Well, the and you can body. see with Tommy Tuberville, right, that he has really not thought about this. I yeah. mean, I, I, I would assume that he knows in the abstract how babies are made, but the actual details of yeah. it um, yeah. and which is just what's so astonishing is that that has not stopped them in the slightest from passing these sweeping laws with such profound consequences for yeah. people's lives and health. I'm going to give you the last word on this, Amanda. Among women, you know, in Texas. At what point does this become a voting issue? Because we have been seeing in conservative states like Texas and Alabama, there not be a reaction to vote out people like the Tommy Tuberville's and these elected officials who are condemning women to health challenges, to maybe losing their lives. At what point is there going to be a reaction electorally, in your view? It absolutely is already a voting issue. And something that I think a lot of people don't know is it's not just our senators and our local elected officials. It's also our Supreme Court justices yes. in Texas. And had we had a very similar suit in Texas, if and when we do have a very similar suit in Texas, I think we would have almost an identical ruling. Yeah. And our Supreme Court is elected and as a matter of fact, three of them are up for re-election this year. And so it already is a voting issue. And I hope people realize that because this is an issue that wins elections. We know that. And we need people to come out and we need people to vote on this. Vote specifically on this. Right. Elections matter. A lot of these states have elected Supreme Courts, y'all. Pay attention. Vote accordingly, according to saving your own life and your own health. Amanda Zorowski, Michelle Goldberg, thank, thank you. you both very much.